If you're obsessed by memories of the past, more than 18 months old, and most of those are negative, so anxiety provoking most often, then there's a lot of you that's stuck in the past. And what that means is you didn't map the territory well enough, and the parts of your brain that are alarm systems, anxiety systems, are saying, no, no, there's holes in the way you're looking at the world. There's holes in the way that you're looking in the world. And you fell in them once, and you don't know where they are, and you don't know how to fill them, and you don't know how to walk around them, and so you can't forget them, you can't forget them, you can't forget them, you can't forget them. So you have recurring nightmares, for example, or a good example of that sort of thing happening. But in, in any case, if you have memories like that, you, you remember them, they make you feel anxious and negative, you're stuck back there. Your body is still reacting as if there's an emergency that could happen again that you haven't fixed. And it doesn't matter if it was your fault, that's irrelevant, because the alarm system doesn't care. Like, when your smoke detector goes off, it isn't relevant whether it was your fault. The smoke detector just says, house is on fire, and that's a bad thing. And your anxiety systems are like that. If, if they're tagging old memories with anxiety, then you have to do something about it, or you will be tortured by those memories forever, because that's how the alarm system works. And so maybe you need to go back there and clean things up. You've got to figure out, okay, well, how did this happen? What sort of role did I play? Even if it's a minor role, that doesn't matter, because the point is, is that you don't want to be put in the same vulnerable position again. So anything you can do to strengthen yourself is good. You know, and often if it's a really old memory, like maybe you were a child, it's, you're not a child now, so you probably have a variety of techniques at hand that you could use to deal with a situation like that if it came up now. And so you have to update that part of your brain that still thinks you're four. And lots of people have parts of them that are still stuck in some traumatic childhood experience. And, and they don't... I, I had a friend like that who had a terrible childhood, and, and I mean really. I, I've had clients with terrible childhoods, and his was like top of the top of the lobster hierarchy in terms of terrible childhoods. And whenever he had a dream about it, which was very often, he was five in his dream. He's 58. You know, he's not five, but hadn't been updated, so he was still five in his dreams. It was a complete bloody nightmares for him complete with all sorts of terrible physiological symptoms, really hurting his life. He couldn't get himself updated. And he's, he's much older in his dreams now, by the way. He's up to about 45, so that's a, which is way better than five, you know, because you can't fight back when you're five. But you can fight back when you're 45, especially if you have some, you know, some, some experience at your disposal. So anyways, you need to know where you are. So let's say where you are is, well, you're on this stage, and you're on this side of the stage, and you decide that you're going to go over to that side of the stage um, just to show that you can. Um, and you're, you're making the decision, the same decision that, you know, the famous chicken who is going to cross the road. Why does the chicken cross the road? Well, if it's a sensible chicken, it's because it assumes that there's something better on the other side of the road. It's like, or it's, maybe it's random curiosity, but then it just gets picked off by a dingo or a coyote. So that's not so good. The other side of the road is better, so away the chicken goes. So that's what you're doing. You're going slump somewhere slightly better. And so that's good. Technically, it's good. Because the way that your positive emotion systems work, they run on a neurochemical called dopamine, which, by the way, is the neurochemical system that drugs like cocaine and methamphetamine and alcohol for some people and opiates affect dramatically and make people feel far better than they should which is part of their danger. Um, it's a very fundamental system. The dopamine system kicks in with a kick of positive emotion if you're going somewhere that's worth going. And so that's worth knowing. It's really worth knowing. It's like, okay, you want a little bit of positivity in your life. Well, how do you get it? Well, you've got to get the system. It's almost the, like it's the left hemisphere system for, for most people. Not that that's particularly relevant, but it's a... It, it, it is a standalone neurochemical system. It's rooted very, very deeply in the brain's exploratory circuitry. So, very ancient, ancient system. And uh, it's happy when you have somewhere to go. That's the first thing. And then it's also happy when you're going there. And so, if I'm on this side of the stage, and I want to go over to that side of the stage, and I see that there's a nice clear pathway, I can just go straight down this line, then I look at that, and I'm actually a little happy. I mean, I mean I'm, not, I'm not ecstatic. I mean, who the hell cares if I get to the other side of the stage, right? I mean, it's, it's a small piece of my life, but it's not nothing. 
It's something. Okay, and so I look at the pathway, and I think, that's a good pathway, and I feel a little positive. And then if I move here, and then I see that uh, little table right in the way between me and, and the other side of the stage, then I'm, I feel a little negative, because I don't want an obstacle in my pathway. And so that's really how you're looking at the world, by the way. You don't see objects. It's not the right way to think about it. We don't see objects, and then think about them, and then evaluate them, and then decide how to act on them. Or if we do, we do it rarely and slowly and with a lot of thought. What we see instead are pathways with tools that will move us forward or obstacles, right? And there's no obstacles here and there's a nice flat road and so great. Positive emotion. We, uh, there, this is a task I can undertake. The sailing is clear. It's a good day. And then I'm here and it's like, yeah, well, that's a little annoying. Um, I, I get a little pang of disappointment let's say anxiety can i make it around that obstacle i'm fairly confident i've done this sort of thing before so i can take the rough route and i can you know walk forward like this and then i can do this great trick which is just this and then you know i've circumvented the obstacle now if i didn't know how to do the little bit of circumvention then that would be a real problem right because i couldn't get from point a to b and that would screw up my plan but I do have that particular skill set. So it's a minor disruption to the perceptual set that I'm using to organize the world. It's a minor bit of chaos, because that's what happens when your perceptual set, the structure that you're using to organize the world, the plan through which you're viewing the complexity of the world reveals an inadequacy, then that destabilizes your emotions. So that's another thing to know. One thing you need to know is you need to be going somewhere and there needs to be a pathway in order for you to feel good. The other thing to know is that if that plan is untenable or becomes destabilized, then what happens is you become flooded with negative emotion, frustration, disappointment, anger, primarily anxiety. But all of those things sort of intermingled. Anger maybe because you have to fight your way through the obstacle. Frustration because maybe you have to make a new plan. Disappointment because you put a bunch of work into the damn plan and it didn't work out. Anxiety because now there's too many choices in front of you. And so people don't like to have their plans disrupted. They don't like to have their plans disrupted. And the reason for that is that their plans are directly associated with their emotional perception of the world. And so, and that, that's a good thing to know too. That's why, you know, what it is, is you've decided that you're going to go to like a Korean restaurant for dinner, and that's fine, and, and it turns out that you can't, and maybe you have to go to a Greek restaurant, and it's like, who cares, right? Unless you hate Greek restaurants. Um, Korean restaurant, that's pretty good. Greek restaurant, that's pretty good. You're still going to be annoyed that your plans changed. But well, why? Well, because it's annoying to have your plans change. It disrupts the structure that you use to destabilize, to stabilize your perceptions of the world. And it throws you momentarily into a state of chaos. Not much. Now, how much chaos? Hmm. This is interesting. We don't know. You know, like... Let's say you wake up one morning and you have an ache in your side. It's like, well, you don't have an ache in your side. What does it mean that you have an ache in your side? Well, you don't know. Like, maybe it means you pulled a muscle and, like, who the hell cares? Maybe it means you have cancer and, like, you're going to be dead in six months. The whole range of possibility is there, you know, and some people will assume one thing. It's like, that's nothing. And some people will assume the other. And all of them will be right sometime. And so the question is, how do you calibrate something like that? And the answer is, well, we tend to guess at it. We guess at it temperamentally. So one way we guess at it is we have our set points for negative emotion. So, so it's neuroticism trait. Some people will be a lot more nervous about a small level anomaly than others. And maybe they'll go to the hospital first and they won't die. And then, or maybe they'll be freaking out all the time and they'll be a hypochondriac, right? So there's pros and cons about being nervous like that. The other person's very emotionally stable. They don't worry about much. They think, ah, it's nothing. And then, you know, by the time they get to the hospital, it's too late. 